Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so here we are again for another one of Ben Averis's brilliant Habitat webinars. Uh, this time we've actually got a brand new one. We didn't have this one last year at all. Um, so Ben's done this one for us as fresh one uh, on coastal habitats of which if you have any coasts in your square, then you'll know that there's a lot of fine habitats within this one and a lot of species to cover. Um, as always, uh, this is being recorded, so if you need to pop out for any reason or um, you can't stay for the whole thing, then it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and you can watch the rest later. Equally, it's a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you, so if you need to communicate with us, <coughs> apologies, please do use the chat. Um, if you've got any questions for our question and answer session, um, please do use the Q&A function, um, that way that we can keep track of where the questions are coming from. Um, so hopefully everyone will enjoy this. Um, I, as per usual, I'm going to be sharing my screen and clicking forward to the next screen for Ben and Ben will have his um, video turned off uh, just because of the bandwidth issue. Um, so yeah, um, Ben, when you're ready, I think I put you on mute just for a minute because uh, we could hear you sort of shuffling about, but I think I've unmuted you now. So um, when you are ready, I will, um, yeah, turn off my camera and mute myself when you're ready you can go okay yeah can, can you hear me all right fine yes thank you yeah okay okay very good um so hello um hello everybody uh thank you for coming i see we've got 30 participants here sorry good um yeah so uh this is a a kind of uh, a pretty quick whiz through these habitats because as sarah said five fine scale habitats here which is actually the most, I just checked, it's the most of any of the MPMS broad habitats. I think the next one down is the lowland grasslands with four, but I know that they're being split into separate whole sessions anyway. So we've got quite a lot to do. Uh, five habitats in one session, which uh, <laughs> maybe I'll talk as fast as I can. I hope you can keep up with me. Um, well, I hope I can think fast enough to talk fast enough. So if we go on to the, um, the next slide and I think it's the next one after that well these are all just kind of beginning pictures aren't they it's a couple of drawings I've done with some coastal places around here some cliffy stuff um, in those ones and the, um, the the next one is where things really begin so as I say we've got five um, fine scale habitats salt marsh sand dunes vegetated shingle macher and um, maritime cliff tops and slopes, the cliffy stuff. So we'll go through them um, in in that order, actually. Yeah, it's in that order, uh, beginning with the salt marsh. And the next picture um, is actually saying, before we do that, it's essential to look at one particular species, which is very relevant to all of them. Uh, I don't know if you've any idea what it is. We'll find out on the next picture here. Perhaps a surprise for um, some people that red fescue, such a nationally common plant um, inland as well, everywhere, is so significant in coastal habitats. But it is. It's really, really common. It gets particularly common in all of the, um, the coastal fine scale habitats here. So it's worth... Um, being familiar with, even though it's not listed in the um, NPMS uh, lists for what he called positive indicators or anything, um, but easily easily recognisable in most places in, along the coast because of, of its swords of very fine, thin, wiry leaves. There are other grasses with thin, wiry leaves, um, but this is by far the commonest one in these coastal habitats. The other ones, the main, the main ones that you might get in these areas sheep's fescue but that's much smaller and has a much um, less opened out flower head and the leaves up the stem are wiry whereas in red fescue it's the has the unusual um oh yes Sarah's just, Sarah's just said because they can be harder to identify but if you see a wiry leaf grass and it's got flower heads that look like that that's one thing and also it's an unusual feature that the leaves that grow up the flowering stems are not wiry they've got about up to about a couple of centimetres of um, width to them. So yeah, red fescue, really, really common everywhere. Uh, now on the next um, slide, we can look at some um, salt marsh, start off with salt marsh. And um, 
basically kind of flattish ground, but it can be cut in, cut up with creeks whose sides can be really very steep and they can be really quite deep. So it can be a lot of up and down going through salt marshes, um, flooded about twice a day. And um, they can be very big and they can be, or you can get little bits of them like that picture there on the bottom left in the Outer Hebrides, just sort of little, little bits of salt marsh vegetation amongst an otherwise um, rocky shore with rock and seaweed and not much else. Um, the next photo, next picture has um, another example of that uh, salt marsh grading down to um, sort of seaweed and stones. In other places, it can just be grading down, down slope, down shore into mud. Well, there is actually mud visible there as well. <clears throat> um, so on the next slide here, we see uh, a couple of species that are very characteristic of that lowest open bare muddy zone that is actually not uh, sort of technically not officially NPMS working habitat for them in salt marshes. Not surprising because it's more flooded more often and um, there's not a great deal there other than glassworts, picture on the left, unusual low-grown, branched, sort of um, fleshy, textured um, <clears throat> plant there, quite unmistakable. Um, it's edible, actually. And the cord grasses, which I don't have a photo of, but they're unusual things. They form patches of upright shoots whose leaves are quite wide at the base, and then they taper gradually to very fine points. And the ligule bit, as I've put in a picture in there, is just a... <clears throat> um, a mass of upright hairs closely oppressed to the stem and um, by far the commonest cord grass uh, they, they used to be called spartina now they're called sporobolus is the other uh, common cord grass sporobolus anglicus much the much the commonest one almost all cord grass that you see will be that <clears throat> so um, that's the zone in which the um, mpms isn't really operating it's more in the upper um, parts of the marsh. So um, if we go on to the next picture, and these are some species that are very common in salt marsh. Obviously the picture on the left is a picture of thrift there with its pink flowers. That's not in salt marsh habitat in that photo. <clears throat> it's on a cliff. But the species is um, one of the commonest ones in salt marsh. Uh, there's its leaves in the middle photo. And also on the right, there's the sea plantain. So these two species, I put them on the same page because although their flowers are completely different, they they both share a lot of um, same habitats, um, salt marsh and cliffs, um, and here and there in sort of shingle places as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm trying to talk too fast. That's why I'm coughing. <laughs> Um, but also another reason to put them together is because their leaves are rather similar. They're narrow and parallel sided and the plants grow in kind of quite dense tufts. So you get these dense masses of um, narrow leaves, rather grass like, but slightly thicker texture. Um, so if you find them without the flowers, you can still tell them apart because the thrift has a groove cut into the middle of the leaf running all the way along the length of its upper surface. You can see it in that photo in the middle. The, um, the sea plantain has leaves that are a little bit wider than the leaves of the thrift and it doesn't have a clear groove cut along the middle. Um, the left and right sides of that upper surface of the sea plantain's leaf can be slightly higher than the middle. It can be like a very very shallow, um, I wouldn't exactly say a valley, but just a slight dip in the middle. But, it, but effectively it looks pretty flat the middle of that, of the upper surface of that leaf. Um, and it's a bit of a thicker texture, slightly more fleshy textured um, leaf as well. So you can sort those two species out vegetatively um, quite easily. When they're in flower, uh, obviously it's a lot easier still. The next picture has a few more plants of uh, salt marsh habitat. And the, um, the first one, I'll wait till the picture changes. Um, 
there we are. The first one on the left, I began with that one because that's also got rather narrow, um, largely parallel sided leaves. I've, I've put in a photograph there specifically of the actual basal parts um, of the shoots. Um, so that if you do find something with fleshy leaves that look a bit like the leaves of sea plantain, there's also a possibility that it might be the sea arrow grass. Um, if the flower heads are there, you see those things on the left there are unmistakable, <clears throat> much taller, uh, longer head than the sea plantain one, with all those little round fruits. But if you don't see that, um, you might be wondering which of the two it is. And you can check down at the lower parts of the shoots and you can see the little ligule, like in a grass. Um, it has a little ligule there at the base of the sheathing part of the leaf. The sea plantain doesn't have that. <clears throat> so that'll always um, separate the sea arrow grass from the sea planting. Um, salt marsh rush in the middle is really one of the very commonest um, plant species in the upper salt marsh zone. It's a very fine kind of rush. It doesn't grow very tall. Um, very slender, narrow leaves. It looks a bit like a miniature version of sharp flowered rush or a little bit like a slender kind of jointed rush. So it has a branched flower head at the top of the stem, um, but it's much finer. And, um, and it doesn't have those, that, you don't get that funny feeling that you get if you feel up the, up the leaf between the finger and the thumb. Um, in the sharp flower and the jointed rush, you can feel all these little um, hardened bits inside, these little cross walls, but it doesn't have that. Uh, there's also the sea rush, Juncus maritimus, which I've mentioned, which is bigger, stiffer, um, <clears throat> taller thing. It's basically quite similar, but um, much bigger and, and, and um, tougher textured and is not quite so widespread as well. So, um, but it, where you do find it is very much a salt, an upper salt marsh plant. And finally, the last two flowers on the right is sea milkwort. It's a beautiful little plant. I suppose the leaves are rather similar to milkwort leaves. Um, they're mostly in opposite pairs. Most milkwort's leaves are not in opposite pairs, <clears throat> apart from the lower leaves of the, um, the heath milkwort. But they're a more fleshy texture here in the sea milkworts, because so many plants have a, a, that kind of texture growing in salt marshes. Um, and the flowers are a little tiny pink, uh, pale pink, quite subtle pink colour, very, very common in salt marshes. I've uh, made a note that it looks a bit like sea sandwort, kind of, um, in a way, but they both got rather fleshy textured opposite leaves. But when you see the sea sandwort, which we'll see later on <coughs> here, it's very different. Um, and it's, it's not so slender, it's a big tougher thing, much, much more thick textured leaves. Okay, um, next page has got a couple of grasses that are very common in salt marshes. Creeping bent, particularly on the upper salt marsh, growing with red fescue and the, the, the salt marsh rush, has a lot of creeping shoots with leaves gradually tapering to a point, just as in other bent grasses, and the flowering head very similar to things like the common bent. Um, but it has a longer ligule, that'll always separate it from the common bent. Um, common bent ligule is really short, uh, creeping bent one goes up to quite a few millimetres um, and it's, it's fairly wide ligule as well so that will separate it from the velvet and brown bents but you're not very likely to see those two species in salt marshes compared with the creeping bents which is really really common. Um, and the um, other one there, the common salt marsh grass <coughs> has um, the flower head is not very distinct, you might say, looking at that picture, quite narrow. It's branched, but the branches don't stick out. It's like it's trying to hide itself um, from our view, that flower head, um, or at least to make itself not very noticeable. But the the shoots with the leaves, they're quite unusual because the, the, leaf, the, the leaf blades, they're um, a few millimetres wide, but they uh, very commonly get um, kind of inroll themselves around, um, around the sides, so they're trying to make themselves look thinner. On the other hand, the sheathing part of the leaf is really quite sort of inflated looking, so it's like, it looks like it's trying to make the whole thing look wider. So it's trying, got, it can't make its mind up. You know, sheathing part wants to go wider, blade wants to go thinner looking. So that makes it easy to tell. And you often get creeping shoots of the Puxinalia with the leaves very much alternating, alternate left and right, that kind of pattern. So it's really very distinctive grass. 
particularly in the sort of more of the middle parts of the um, salt marsh, middle and even lower, not quite so common in the upper where it's more of the creeping bent and the red fescue take over. Um, okay, next uh, picture is um, the first of a few pictures of, um, of some more kind of herbs that we get in the salt marshes. Sea aster, very, very common. Uh, the leaves, you might say they're quite ordinary looking really, just a narrow kind of oval, but they're quite distinctive in that way. They don't have any teeth. Uh, they're, they're fleshy texture. They look a bit like the same, the same shape as the leaves of Devil's Bit Scabious, um, but the fleshy texture is, makes them quite different. They're kind of opaque and on quite a decent length of stalk. When it's got flowers out, of course, it's easy to tell those lovely pale mauve flowers. Um, sometimes they don't actually have the petals, they just have a yellow bit in the middle. Um, very common in um, kind of middle to lower salt marsh zone especially. And the Suedo maritima, the annual sea blight, not quite so distinctive, very branched plant with very narrow parallel sided um, but, but fleshy textured leaves again. And um, flowers really very small, <clears throat> those little leaves are quite pointed. Uh, nothing much else really, really similar to that, even though it's rather dull looking, but you know, a common plant in salt marshes. Uh, next page has a couple of species that I've not got photographs of, so I just draw, drew some pictures in colour pencils. Um, the sea purslane, you see the leaves of that, they're actually a little bit like the leaves of the sea aster that we had on the previous page, but um, <clears throat> they're the, the whole plant is, is bushy, it's like a little shrub, uh, with woody stems, at least lower down they are, and a lot of the leaves coming up as it pairs. So there's nothing else really like it. Um, it's got a more southern distribution, it goes in Scotland just along to um, the Solway coast, um, and then from there southwards through England and Wales, um, and Ireland as well. Uh, very, very distinctive plant, like all these little low bushes on the salt marsh. Nothing else like that. And the sea lavender has also got um, oval, um, untoothed leaves, but they, they come in a rosette all at the base of the plant, and the stems are very branched with all these little tiny um, pale purplish coloured flowers. There are lots of different kinds of, um, <coughs> of sea lavenders um, differing in very subtle ways from each other. But for NPMS purposes, it's just a case of calling it sea lavender. You know, it doesn't you don't have to differentiate between them all. And um, they are common generally around the coasts. So in, in salt marshes. Uh, okay, the next picture has got some more pictures, more some photos and some drawings. Scurvy grasses. There are three species, main main species there that we can find in these habitats. They've all got leaves that are slightly fleshy textured and, um, and, and they've got little sort of spikes of um, either white or pale pinky, pale mauve sort of flowers. In the case of the Danish scurvy grass, they're this sort of pale pinky colour. Um, and the Danish scurvy grass is the smallest of them all, has that distinctive uh, leaf shape going slightly towards the shape of an ivy leaf almost. Um, and the Danish scurvy grass is that thing that grows along roadsides in land as well. It's colonised <clears throat> in, in land being carried along by vehicles, and the seeds of it. Um, otherwise, these plants are really mainly coastal, except the common scurvy grass will grow inland in hill areas along, um, along streams and flushes. So um, they're generally pretty easy to tell because of the fleshy textured leaves, slightly fleshy textured, and the different leaf shapes among the three species. Um, marsh pennywort, <clears throat> is, this, isn't, this isn't such a strictly coastal plant at all. It grows very commonly inland in all kinds of um, neutral wetlands, uh, typically uh, as in that photo with that spiky looking moss called Caliogonella, which also likes the same kind of habitats. But it'll, um, it'll turn up in the upper parts of salt marshes here and there. Um, you can always identify it because the leaves are round with these what they call crenulate margins, like very rounded teeth. Um, they, don't, they don't stick out very much. Flowers are very small, not terribly conspicuous. <clears throat> and, um, so um, absolutely unmistakable plants. 
uh, this wall pennywort has similar looking leaves, but they're thicker, fleshy texture, and it grows on walls and rocks and on the bases of trees. A totally different habitat. Silverweed, which we can find especially in the upper edge of the salt marsh and in some other coastal habitats too, like the, um, the shingle, strandline habitat. Um, unmistakable plant, it's in the rose family, lovely yellow flowers, like a, a big yellow tormentil flower, a little bit, except it's got more petals. I've uh, got five petals <coughs> instead of four. And the leaves, um, lots of pairs of um, leaflets arranged left and right along the leaf stalk. And um, it's got a silvery colour on the underside of the leaf, hence the name. And that silvery the colour comes right to the very edge. So even when you're looking down the top upper, upper surface of the leaf, you'll still get that hint of silver. Um, and it's a creeping sort of plant, creeps low um, along the upper salt marsh zone and strand line. Okay, the next page has got a few more. Uh, those sea spurries, they're very low grown things that are pretty inconspicuous if you've just got the leaves, they're sort of fleshy, uh, textured, rather linear leaves, a bit like the leaves of the shrubby sea blight that we had earlier, but the, um, the, it's not really such a branched or <clears throat> rather or shrubby looking plant as that one is. And when it's got the flowers, these nice pale mauve flowers, um, the two species, the greater and the lesser. Um, the greater is obviously a little bit bigger, I've given the dimensions there, and the petals of the lesser are relatively smaller as well. Um, easy things to tell. And the, <clears throat> the sea beet is um, it's related to goosefoots and oranges that are slightly dock-like plants. A lot of those goosefoots and oranges have rather greyish tinged leaves, but here they're a bit more definitely green and they've got a nice shine to them. Um, and the plant look, can look a bit bushy um, and grows along the uh, very upper edge of the salt marsh and on shingles as well, and, um, and, and even around the lower parts of cliffs. <clears throat> so that's quite a distinctive thing, the sea beet. The sea um, cooch or couch, however you like to pronounce it, is uh, very similar to the common cooch, couch, I don't know which is supposed to be the best pronunciation, people pronounce things different ways. It's very similar to it, except it's got a distinctive bluey tinge. Um, and if in doubt, you can have a look at the top of the leaf sheath there, the sheathing part on one side of it, it's got a, little, a whole load of tiny hairs along there. So it's um, a plant of the upper salt marsh zone. Um, going up as far north as the, the far south of Scotland. Um, cooch grass, of course, is not very popular with people in gardens. Sea cooch is not going to um, figure there in, um, in uh, it's, it's not, uh, <clears throat> it's not going to be coming into people's gardens. So it's a, it's a sort of no problem species <laughs> from that point of view. Uh, nice looking colour. Uh, the next page has the last of the species so I'm just whizzing through here, a salt marsh species. This is a northern species. It's not very tall. It's, uh, it's a kind of sedge, really, um, although it's not in the genus Carex. It has a very flattened um, head in one plane. It doesn't show really in that photo. But if you took any one in the head and you turned it around, it's thinner in one dimension, wider in the other, and a very dark brown, uh, really quite a simple looking plant. <clears throat> and um, the, the leaves are just narrow, a bit like rush leaves, hairless. Um, so it, it forms patches, they're quite dense, but rather small, often linear patches in the very uppermost parts of the salt marsh. Um, and and they, can, yeah, they can be forming lines either right along parallel, parallel to the upper edge of the marsh, or sometimes sneaking out um in different patterns across the marsh quite distinctive it tends to look darker the patches of it have a tend, generally have a darker look than the, most of the upper salt marsh vegetation that it will be mixed with um so that was a quick whiz through um salt marshes we can now go on to the next um picture we'll begin with the sand dunes sand dunes really um, multiple habitat themselves, really, all sorts of different kinds. Uh, wet and dry, most typical 
um, the image people have of sand dunes will be the drier one, drier sort of like the hillocks that you can see there, um, made of sand. Uh, but you get these, these wetter hollows in them as well, dune slacks, really a very different mix of species in the dune slacks, but they come into this um, MPMS fine scale habitat as well. Uh, what it actually doesn't include though, I mean, is this part of dunes, but the MPMS <clears throat> um, it doesn't work um, in this particular uh, particular part of the dunes, and that is the most seaward edge, the most mobile dunes, where um, you've got um, things like marram grass growing uh, in what's otherwise just sand with not much else growing underneath. Um, these, the, these kind of mobile dunes where everything's changing quite a lot over, over a period of years. They, um, for some reason, the MPMS, uh, they, they say, don't do the recording there. Um, stick to the more kind of stable dunes, a little bit further inland, where we'll get other species, we'll see photographs of these species a bit. Um, and, and of course, the dune slacks are generally part of the more stable dune um, environment. So um, the next picture, uh, has some photos <clears throat> of the kind of species in the more mobile stuff, just to show what it can look like, the stuff that uh, the MPMS isn't to be done in. Um, and the, there's the marum there. Marum is one of the very, very commonest species in sand dunes as a whole, um, both in the mobile dune um, habitats and in the more stable, the more kind of fixed dune habitats. So if you see a whole load of marum there, it doesn't that that in itself isn't going to tell you if this is the the more, the more mobile dune that you shouldn't be working in, or if it's the more fixed dune that's more okay. You just need to look and see if it's more if it's just sort of bare sand underneath the marum with hardly anything growing in there. That'll be a mobile one. Um, in the fixed one, fixed dunes, stable dunes, there'll be a lot of other thing, other things growing with that marum, a more continuous vegetation cover in total. Uh, I put lime grass and sand um, couch or cooch in there as well, so it's to help recognise them because lime grass in particular are very easily recognisable plants with these great big um, bluey green, um, bluey grey tinged leaves, quite unmistakable. Very much a plant of the kind of fortune habitat. Sand cooch, a bit less obvious. It's um, a kind of low grown not such a greyish green, but a slightly greyish green plant with a flowering head that looks a bit like a cooch grass. The flowering head can look a little bit oversized for the um, height of the plant and the width of the leaves. Um, <clears throat> it can flop around a little bit, but that sand cooch in particular is very much a, a plant of the seaward edge of the dunes where the MPMS uh, isn't, isn't operating. The next um, slide <coughs> has an example of dune heath. Um, some might say I could have taken that photo in the summer when the heather was in flower, but well, sorry about that. <laughs> it's because um, you get a nice purple colour, but uh, it's easy to recognise dune heath. It's um, it's always going to look dark with the um, heather or bell heather or crowberry in some places. If you find um, if you find that, then uh, it, it'll be something that you can record in um, MPMS Heathland habitat, not the dune one. There's a little bit of a different flora there. <clears throat> it's not very common though, it's a good, good thing to see. Um, the next picture has another example of habitat that you could get among the dunes, but is not to be recorded in the MPMS dunes. This is any kind of scrub, um, sea buckthorn scrub that I've uh, photographed here is is very much the dune habitat but it'll be um, something to record in the woodland um, MPMS woodland and scrub habitat not the sand dune one. I've uh, shown some dune in front of it though which you would be doing in the MPMS it's obviously a more stable kind of dune there's a lot of stuff growing in there amongst the um, the tufts of marum and that includes, in this particular case, a whole load of lichens. Lichens and mosses are not strictly MPMS things at all. Although if you do find some dunes and there's a load of lichens in there, happening to be there in the place where you're working, it's worth making some notes of them, maybe just in photograph or something, because it'd be interesting to see how they change. The lichen-rich dunes are quite a special habitat. 
Right. Okay, uh, the next picture has uh, an example of kind of um, relatively um, stable, fixed, obviously not 100% stable, but um, the kind of dune habitat where um, NPMS is uh, very much valid. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of other stuff growing there amongst the tufts of marum, short grasses and herbs, and it can be um, really quite species rich. There's pink flowers of the wild thyme in there, for example, which uh, shows that it's not really very acid. Um, the next photo has another example of um, marum dominated dunes, <clears throat> which in the foreground have got a lot of vegeta other vegetation growing amongst the marum tussocks. You can just see a little bit of greener stuff in the lower central part of the picture um, and, um, and a little bit beyond. But at the seaward edge in that photo, um, obviously you can't see the detail, but you can't see that it's just bare sand underneath the marum at the seaward edge. But um, if you were there, <laughs> you would notice that difference as you walk in a seaward direction and, and, and you can sense, you can tell that's where it becomes the more mobile dune habitat um, not to be recorded in. So um, next picture has uh, an example of um, dune with a lot of marum, just as we've been seeing in these last photos, and um, a lot of other vegetation, a lot of um, other growth with it. So this is very much uh, an example of uh, the more stable kind of dune. This has actually got some little um, shrubs of blackthorn and the burnet rose. And some of the grass, it's not all marum, some of that tall grass is um, false oak grass, Aranathum, which is actually really, really common in a lot of the um, more stable parts of um, sand dunes. <clears throat> I'll show you a close up picture of that a bit later. Um, but first, sort of still at the habitat level, the next picture shows um, an example of one of the dune slacks, those little hollows. They can only be very, sometimes they're just very shallow hollows, um, not, not, not that much, not that far below. It doesn't have to be obvious hills, hills of um, dry dune and like valleys of other stuff. Um, the gradation is quite subtle, but it's, uh, Here's a dune slack. You can tell that it's a bit damper because the silverweed is very abundant. That's a species that does like damp conditions, especially where it's um, it, where, where the water levels go up and down over time. So that's one example of um, dune slack. Actually, in the distance there, there's a lot of um, meadow sweets, which also likes it damp. Um, and the next photo has a uh, dune slack vegetation that is um, very short grazed and uh, at first glance that could be all sorts of things really it could just be fairly fairly dry short grassland but it's uh, when you look in there at the species you find various wetland plants and um, it's would it would be a, a difference in the flora there between that and the um, stuff on the drier dunes, which hasn't got so much marum in it. Actually, marum doesn't tend to get um, so much into the dune slacks. It's really a plant more of the drier parts of the dunes, as we can see in the distance in that photo. Um, uh, the next um, next picture has, um, it's a bit like when we had a few photos back. There's, um, but this is actually a dune slack. It doesn't look very obviously wet, but there's a lot of salix repens, the creeping willow in it. You can see those grayish green narrow oval leaves in the foreground. Um, and the grasses there include the Yorkshire form. You can see the flower heads of it in the very foreground and um, in the left bottom left corner. Um, it's a, uh, another kind of dune slack. Dune slacks vary, you know, a lot in their appearance. And this particular kind of dune slack is not the wettest. It's actually towards the drier end of dune slacks. And it can be quite thickly vegetated with uh, with a lot of creeping willow and Yorkshire fog, but still gets flooded from time to time, not as frequently as the um, some of the other dune slacks. Um, okay, so the next... Um, Next picture is just at the start, starting now to look through some of the actual species, closer views of individual species that are 
very um, characteristic of the sand dune fine scale habitat as a whole, both including the dry dunes and the wetter dune slacks. Um, so we can't not show a photo of Marin uh, because it's about the most single most characteristic species really of sand dunes in total compared with other habitats in Britain and Ireland. Um, <clears throat> although it's actually not listed as a positive indicator in the end, be it NPMS. Uh, easy one to tell because it forms these great big dense tussocks uh, with long narrow leaves that are quite sharply pointed at their tips. You can sort of have to watch your eyes and the leaf blades can be quite enrolled and the ligule, that little sh uh, sort of sticking up bit at the base of the leaf blade can be really, really long up to about three centimeters, which is extraordinarily long. Um, I was saying that and I've just noticed I've used the same, right, the same term, extraordinarily. <laughs> it's going to just be my way of saying it. Um, and um, uh, the flower heads, just a sort of long, dense, unbranched, um, mass of spikelets, so easy one to identify. It's a rather greyish green colour as well. Um, extremely common in all the drier parts of um, sand dunes. The next picture uh, has the um, photos, some photos of that lime grass that we had a few pages back looking at the four dune um, kind of habitat that the MPMS is not involved in. The more um, very, very mobile side of the dunes but just again to um, help us to remind one really to be aware of it uh, those much wider leaves are much much wider than marin leaves and they're very distinctly bluey gray tinged the flower, flower heads look rather similar to those of marin grass at least from a distance but the leaves are the best uh, most effective way to tell it tell the species apart unmistakable plant is the lime grass um, the next picture shows um, sand sedge, very, very common plant in sand dunes. Uh, it actually gets into some of the dune slacks as well. Very, very quite wide ranging. Uh, the leaves, the leaves are quite ordinary, really, just a few millimeters across, sort of mid green. To look at those leaves could be individually, they could be leaves of, of various other sedges. Um, but uh, the way you see it in the dunes is that you have one tuft and then another tuft and another tuft, all just a little, little distance apart. They're connected underground with the um, rhizome and they can form straight lines. Uh, so I've uh, shown the photograph at the bottom there. Um, so anything looking like that in the sandy place by the sea, that's almost certain to be that species. The flower head is um, the sort of dense mass of, of brown colored spikelets clustered at the top of the stem. There are other, other sedges that do something similar with their flower heads, particularly Carex distica, the brown sedge. Um, uh, but brown sedge is a more sort of tough, robust looking plant with um, wider leaves and it's um, <clears throat> more leafy stems, leaves going well up the stems. And uh, it's a plant of mesotrophic kind of wetland habitats, uh, especially inland. It can, can grow by the coast, but it's really a wetland plant, bigger, more robust. Um, <clears throat> with, the, with the sand sedge, the um, flowering head is often sort of uh, bending over a bit. It looks like it looks a bit top heavy. It looks like the, the rest of the plant's not built for the, um, the size and the bulk of the head. Whereas Carex distic of the brown sedge, it is, it sticks up better. Okay, the next picture, I said that we'd have a photograph of the false oak grass, the Aranathrum, which is a big tall grass that can grow very, very commonly with marum on the more inland stable parts of dunes, grey dunes as they call them, these more stable ones. Um, so there it is, it's actually the, species, uh, one of the, the same species that we see so commonly along roadside verges, verges that haven't been cut very much or haven't been grazed a lot, um, otherwise the, um, the animals will uh, eat it, it's quite a palatable grass. Uh, tall grass, it can form quite distinct tussocks in some places and um, the leaves are rather broad, and the flower head is branched, but the flowers, the branches don't open out very, very widely. 
and the whole flower head tends to droop slightly to one side and the spikelets have quite shiny, shiny silvery um, machine to them and projecting hair-like horns at the ends of the individual spikelets. Um, very common um, grass that uh, even people who say they don't know much about grasses, if you showed them that, especially the flowering shoots, they would say, oh yes, I've seen that stuff along roadsides. And in the same sorts of places along roadsides and other places that have not grazed uh, very much, you can find the coxfoot in the grass. It's a bit of a more stiff, robust textured um, plant, but uh, overall size similar to that of the false oak grass, very often grows with it. It likes the same kind of soils. Um, it's basically well-drained, more or less neutral soils, that is. Um, but its leaves are a bit more of a bluey tinge and the shoot is very flattened right down at the very base and the leaf, the sheathing part of the leaf is like it's folded, it's got a sort of keel along the middle and even the leaf blades have something of that folded appearance, um, folded up above the middle, at least the lower parts of the leaf blades. Um, so it's very distinct and the flower head is absolutely unmistakable. The only flower head that looks anything like that is going to be um, reed canary grass, Phalaris arundinacea, which is a wetland plant that doesn't form uh, tussocks, and, uh, sort of dense tufts like the coxfoot does. It has uh, stands of like a reed bed, it looks like a reed bed, like the common reed you know, with these tall leafy stems growing singly from, from rhizomes, completely different look to it. But its flower head is a little bit uh, sort of, you might say, blobby, um, like the coxfoot. Um, so, Next page, we've got some of the more colourful flowering herbs of um, and herbs that we can find in sand dunes. And these ones are all um, in the pea family, they're all clovers. And well, black medic on the right is not strictly speaking a clover, but it's, you know, it's got three leaflets. They've all got three leaflets and they're all the same family. Uh, white clover is um, are pretty unmistakable with those very rounded leaflets and have pale blotches on them. You get it everywhere, uh, especially on neutral soils that are fairly nutrient rich as well as like that kind of nutrient rich um, soil. Um, in contrast to the red clover that um, is like, you know how white clover is often a sign that there's been some agricultural treatment applied there um, or maybe a place where there's been a lot of dung and urine from grazing animals. Red clover is not really, it, it's, uh, it likes fairly neutral soils that are moderately nutrient rich, but it's not one that takes off in a big way where there has been nutrient enrichment. And it's actually quite a good thing to have. You find it more in the agriculturally unimproved grasslands. Uh, its leaflets are narrower, more pointed, and those are the white clover. When it's got the flowers, of course, you can tell it easily. The strawberry clover looks like white clover more, more than anything else, but the leaves don't have the white, that have the pale blotches and the um, flowers, when they go into fruit, they kind of look a bit like strawberries. I don't think you can eat them. You probably could eat them. I don't know what they taste like. <clears throat> Never tried. Uh, we don't often see it around here. It's a more southern plant. Um, in salt marshes, you can find it, salt marshes and um, dune slacks. The salt marshes is on the very, very uppermost edge. Um, but yeah, dune slacks as well. There's, there's some kind of similarity in habitats between some some kind of dune slack and some kinds of salt marsh. The black medic is one of a number of clover type plants whose flowers are yellow and they come in little um, small heads, a lot smaller than the um, typical white clover or red clover heads. Um, and the most similar one to the black medic is the lesser yellow trefoil, Trifolium dubium, but you can tell them apart because the black medic is actually a bigger plant. It can scramble up to a fair height among other, other species. But the leaflets, if you look at any leaflets, you'll see as in the one on the left, about halfway up that photo, there's a little point at the very tip. It's almost like the end comes in slightly and then there's a point right in the middle and then um, and what's otherwise a sort of bla uh, uh, flattened or even slightly incoming uh, sort of um, dip coming in at the, um, the leaf tip, but then it's got that purposeful tip. Uh, lesser yellow trefoil don't have that. So 
easy one to tell and can be <clears throat> can be quite common in some of the dunes. These um, these are all NPMS positive indicators in the dune habitat. Uh, and there's four more of these on the next page, some more positive indicators of sand dunes. <clears throat> Carline thistle, quite small as thistles go. Um, if it's in flower, it's dead easy to tell because the flowers, you know how most thistles are pinky, purpley kind of colour? Well, this one, they're kind of buff colour. Um, if it's not got flowers, the leaves look very much like other thistles, but they're very uh, sort of white, cottony, um, textured white beneath. That helps to tell it. It likes pretty calcareous soils. Um, generally rather southern, that species. Um, the geranium, the bloody cranesbill, geranium sanguinium, easy to tell in flower, those bright, big, bright pink flowers. Um, when the flowers aren't there, you can still tell it because it's quite, you get quite a dense clumped appearance to the growth form of the plant as a whole with all this mass of leaves that are cut deeply into lobes. And they're, they're kind of a bit like the leaves of the meadow buttercup, which we'll see um, pretty soon. In fact, we'll see that on the next page, but, um, it's, but it differs from the meadow buttercup in that the leaf shape, the whole sort of outline of leaf is more round and the tips of those lobes are um, a bit, little bit blunter. Um, and the whole plant looks a bit more bushy. The mouse ear hawkweed, you'll never mistake that for anything really because the leaves are oval and that might sound quite ordinary and they don't have teeth on their edges. So uh, ordinary in that sense, but the, um, you get whitish colored hairs on the um, upper surface of the leaf and they're really really long um, in relation to the size of the leaf they're really sort of extra long hairs and the underside of the leaf is very whitish in color um, and you often get creeping this on the, on the lower half of that picture creeping shoots and they can go on for a long distance creeping over the ground with just these leaves the flower heads a bit like a dandelion in the, you know the shape of the flower and it's yellow and it's just a flower on the end of a single stem with no leaves up the stem. But um, it's a paler yellow than dandelion and the leaf stalk, um, sorry, the, the flower stalk is hairy. They've got quite a nice uh, smell, those flowers as well. Um, this corn salad I put on the, on the right there, <coughs> it's a funny looking plant. It's got leaves in um, opposite pairs and the, the stems kind of fork. It's all, all this all happens within a low, um, short distance above the ground, so it doesn't grow very tall. And then these um, these very pale, very very pale blue flowers, little little groups of them. There's um, it's it's a plant of sort of fairly open, dryish places. I don't think it'll compete very well with uh, thick and, and taller vegetation growth in general. So. Um, some kind of sandy ground uh, in in the drier parts of dunes it can do pretty well um, so there's four more um, NPMS positive indicators and the next page has some of these buttercups because they can be very common in the sand dunes um, and a couple of them are positive indicators that's the meadow one creeping one positive indicators in the sand dune habitat. <clears throat> Meadow buttercup on the left, that leaf, as I say, it's a bit like the leaf of the, um, the bloody crane spill, but it's a bit more triangular in its outline and the um, tips of the, uh, the, the lobes, all those divisions are a bit, a bit more pointed. The species is a lot more common as well. That crane spill is not really so common. Uh, when it's got the flowers out, you can tell it very easily. And it can grow quite tall with quite branched stems. The creeping buttercup and the bulbous buttercup have very different leaves in which they have two leaflets on the right on, on short stalks and then a bare stalk bit and then some more leaflets or lobes with pale blotches as well. And the uh, bulbous one, which could equally be an NPMS positive indicator, it would qualify because it's actually a really good species to find. Um, has downturned sepals, as I've illustrated on the photo on the right. Uh, okay, try and whiz through these before we have our, if we're going to have a break. Uh, 
halfway through. I'll try and get through the sand dunes uh, pictures. So the next picture um, has creeping willow, a close-up view. Um, it's a low-grown willow with narrow oval leaves, but they have a kind of silky finish, especially on their undersurfaces. But the younger leaves have silky hairs on the upper surface too. And um, then, uh, so it's a sort of grayish tinge to it overall. Very common in a lot of the dune slacks, the damper parts of dunes. The creeping sanquefoil, it's, um, it's a bit like an oversized tormentil, but with five petals instead of four. And the leaflets, they come in, um, in fives, whereas in tormentil, they come in, um, in threes. Um, there's also Potentilla anglica, which is sort of in between the two, what's it called, trailing tormentil, which you don't really get so much in the dune habitat. And um, that has more kind of, uh, not all the leaflets in, in fives, you can get them in fours or even some in threes maybe, and it's a bit, a bit smaller. And, and it doesn't go so much for disturbed habitats or sand dune habitats. Creeping sanquefoil here does very much like dunes and all sorts of places where it's a bit disturbed, competitions reduced a bit, and it can spread creeping long ways over the ground, long distances. Uh, buckshorn plantain, you'll never mistake that for anything, a low rosette of leaves with these kind of long teeth, or you could call them small lobes, and they're quite hairy. Nothing else looks anything like it. Okay, next picture. Um, back in the pea family on the left, leaves a bit like a kind of cloverish um, leaf with three leaflets, but it was also also two stipules, leaf, leaflet-like stipules at the bases of the leaf stalks. So it's a bit like they come in fives, like two at the base, then a stalk, and then three. And they're slightly grayish green, and then those relatively big yellow pea-shaped flowers. Um, pretty easy. Uh, you might confuse it with the um, greater bird's foot trefoil, which goes in damper places and has more, it goes bigger, taller, and has more hairy leaves and a more hollow stem. This tends to have a more solid stem. Uh, ladies' bed straw, easily told from all the other bed straws because the leaves are very narrow, parallel sided, and they come in whirls of between eight and 12, which is more than you get in most bed straws. And when it's in flower, all those um, little tiny um, yellow flowers all massed together in uh, what can be quite a long spike at the end, unmistakable. It likes dryish places on neutral to calcareous soils, so it's not surprising it does well in a lot of the drier dunes. Sea holly. Uh, this, uh, you'll never take it for anything else. This sort of greyish, pale greyish green, prickly leaves. It, um, it grows, especially where there's not much competition with other plants. So the more sandy parts, younger dunes, the more mobile dunes, not NPMS dune habitat there, or in shingle as well, you can find it. Um, right, next picture. Whizzing through <coughs> as fast as I can, some sedges on the left. These are, they, those are more common in the dune slacks, actually, the sedges, where it gets a bit wetter. Uh, those two, the glaucus and the common sedge, have leaves of a greyish tinge, sort of bluey grey tinge to them. Um, the glaucus sedge female spikes uh, hanging, you can see them sticking out or hanging down some of them because they're on long stalks, whereas those of the common sedge are on such short stalks or even no stalks at all and they are held really close up against the main stem of the plant. The same is true of the leaves in, in that the leaves of the, the lower leaves of the glaucus sedge tend to spread out from the bottom of the plant whereas those of the common sedge will stick up more. Um, glaucus sedge has leaf uh, that's very much paler on the underside and darker and duller on the upper side whereas two sides of the leaf are more the same colour on the common sedge. That um, lesser meadow rue has a distinctive leaf but divided up in with very fine little stalks um, with little, little, little sort of lobed segments at their tips. A bit like a fern of some kind, but you'll never mistake it for a fern when it's got all those creamy coloured flowers, lots of tiny creamy coloured flowers and quite a big openly branched head. Tufted vetch. This is a really superb vetch, you know, because as vetches go, this one gives you the like the maximum number of pairs of, of, of leaflets all lined up there. 
and you could say likewise maximum number of uh, flowers in a spike so it doesn't mess about compared with something like bush fetch you know where it might be a bit stingy on how many flowers you get in a spike this one it's it delivers as they might say horrible i don't like to use that kind of terminology we have some today so much delivering benefits or whatever people say anyway you could say tufted fetch, tufted fetch delivers us something pretty special to look at and it clambers around in all kinds of um, taller vegetation ranging from wetlands to sort of drier grasslands not surprising that we can find it in um, in the dunes um, okay next picture these are wetter more wetland species of dune slacks ragged robin in flower it kind of looks a bit like um, the, the red campion but the uh, the petals are all kind of torn ragged and it's um, its leaves are narrower than those of red campion which is really quite, quite lush broad hairy leaves ragged robin they're in opposite pairs and they're quite thin <clears throat> marsh pennywort we had that earlier back but it's um i'm putting it in here because it's very much a species of dune slacks and other kinds of um, neutral wetlands inland so those round leaves yellow flag Beautiful plant, great big tall tufts, like they've been flattened, compressed from side to side. The, the tall tufts of hairless green leaves and great big yellow flowers um, at the tops of the stems. Nothing else at all like it. And it likes damp to wet, more or less neutral soil. So it's not surprising, it does very well in, um, in dune slacks. It grows particularly well around coasts generally, actually. <clears throat> Meadow sweet likes all kinds of damp to wet neutral soils so again doom slack it's not surprising we find it there creamy flowers uh, lots of flowers all massed together they have a nice smell uh, leaves are always very distinct in that they're a bit like ash leaves the way they're divided up with left and right pairs of leaflets but the leaflets are um, very sharply toothed around their edges and the stem that goes um, through them, the, the, the leaf stalk is usually reddish tinged. In fact, the stalks of the whole plant are rather reddish tinged. And in between the main leaflets, you can get tiny little miniature leaflets. They don't really show in that photo, but um, in between the leaflets, these little tiny things, they're almost unique to meadow sweet. Next page um, is some more, these are all pale whitish colored flower things, valerian, the leaves are um, sort of like a, like an ash shape again, but kind of not hugely, not very obviously too. They have a few distant teeth and it's quite a tall plant with a big branched head uh, of pale whitish to pale pink flowers. Um, Angelica is a really stout, tough looking umbellifer with leaves that, uh, they adopt that kind of fern style of being divided up multiple ways but um not as not as much as in some of the other umbellifers that you get along the sides of roads like the cow parsley um in fact that leaf looks rather like the leaf of ground elder except it's divided up a little bit more and you get a purplish bit of a blotch in at those points in within the leaf where the leaf stalk branches um you get a little little purple darker purplish bit whereas ground elder leaves are all green and the basis of the leaves and the basis of the those um, other the, the branches within the flowering head have very wide sheaths to them. So uh, very distinctive plant, grows pretty big. The two bed straws, they are very common in these kind of places. Well, especially the marsh bed straw, fen bed straw rather less so. Um, marsh bed straw has fewer leaves in a whirl and they're not so neatly arranged and they're not so sharply pointed at their tips. Fen bed straw is much more even and, and neat. And, um everything all the, all the spacing same all the way around fine looking plant okay next picture these are a few pictures this next picture which is the last of the <laughs> of the dune ones this is an uh, another photo of some dune slack vegetation just to show how similar it can look to um other kinds of wetlands on more or less neutral soils um so and they share such a lot in in species so dune slack as a whole is not um very obvious from its species composition 
I mean, there are differences if you if you're using something like the National Vegetation Classification. You know, there are some differences. They're relatively subtle though, um, because the, some of these dune slacks have so much in common with um, inland um, sedgy, especially some of the sedge neutral sedge wires you can find. So um, that's uh, the end of the dune section, which is putting up nearly halfway through uh, where yes. we have our break. Yeah, so that's a good, oh, good place to have a little five minute comfort break, I think, Ben. So yeah. um, it's exactly 11 o'clock. So at five past 11, we'll resume um, after everyone's had a break, okay? Okay.
Great, hopefully that's given everyone a chance just to stretch their legs or whatever they need to do. Um, and Ben, hopefully you're okay and ready to resume. Yep. yep. Oh, okay, let's <laughs> <coughs> Okay, so um, our next picture, uh, next page is um, uh, the starts of the coastal vegetated shingle habitat. And uh, I don't know about you, but if you think of coastal vegetated shingle, I always tend to think of like uh, how you uh, so often see it's a narrow band right along the sort of strand line, shingle and some plants growing on it. Um, and um, but the, the NPMS actually says um, that it should be a wider band if we're going to be doing work in coastal vegetated shingle habitat. <clears throat> it, it should be. Um, not just that kind of narrow two or three meters thing that we see an example of there. Um, so um, on the next page is another photo. Um, this uh, this is wider, only that I've stretched the same photo that we just saw on the previous page. So actually, I didn't think I thought that would look pretty pretty uh, sort of unreal, but it looks quite in a way quite convincing. But obviously, I, that's, that's, that's cheating, I can't do that. So the next page has an example of um, genuine coastal vegetated shingle, um, which I don't have a photograph of. So I took myself on Google Street View down to some place on the south coast of England and drew a colour pencil picture of some, it looks quite nice, I'd like to go there one day. Um, coastal vegetated shingle, a wider band mix of open shingle and bits of uh, <clears throat> vegetation of all sorts of different species. So that's kind of um, what it looks like. Um, next picture, next page, we can start going through some of the species we find in this habitat. Um, these are some of these species we've already seen. Oh, somebody says Dungeness, great place to look at it. Yeah, I bet there's huge on the map, isn't it? There's a huge, big uh, expanse of stuff. I've never been there. Um, uh, jutting out in the sea, great big big thing. Um, so uh, these species are ones we've already had on previous pages, but you know, just to mention, they are characteristic species of the shingle habitat, and they're NPMS positive indicators, uh, indeed here as well. Silverweed <coughs> and the um, the marum and the buckthorn plantain with those unmistakable funny toothed leaves, and. Um, Next page, we've got some of these. These are really characteristic of the shingly kind of habitat. The atriplex, the orages. Um, atriplex is the same genus as one that we had earlier. The um, in in the in the salt marsh, that sort of very shrubby one. <clears throat> but these are completely different looking plants. They're kind of lower grown. They're not. They don't have anything woody in them, and. Um, their leaf shape is not um, that kind of simple oval. It's more kind of variably triangular with uh, lobes or big teeth, quite, a, quite, quite varied, with, generally with a greyish tinge, in some cases really strongly frosty grey, um, like the picture on the right. There are quite a number of species. They're not always very straightforward to tap, uh, tell apart from each other. Uh, which is good news in that uh, the NPMS doesn't require us to do that, it just says these atriplex uh, species as a group. <clears throat> that is, so that is atriplex, um, but not including the, um, the atriplex portulacoides, the sea pursley that we had earlier, that's the salt marsh plant, quite different ecologically and very different in its appearance. Um, okay, so those, those are NPMS species and then the next in, in the shingle habitat and the next page has got some more. Uh, the south thistles, south thistles are relatively tall plants with slightly dandelion shaped leaves but more definitely cut up and two of them perennial and prickly one are NPMS positive indicators here. Perennial is the one is a, the tallest with stems that are hairy in their upper parts. The, um, the other south thistles are smooth, uh, not, not hairy. The prickly south thistle has the leaf base kind of a broad rounded shape with lots of um, lots of big teeth on it. Um, if you find something that looks like that but has the leaf base not so rounded but more tapering to a point on each side of the, uh, of the, of the stem, 
then that's the sound that's the smooth sound whistle which is not included as an MPMS indicator here um, so the three south south whistles aren't difficult to tell apart really um, the, oh, so the prickly south whistle tends to look a bit more shiny than the um, smooth one as well um, smooth south whistle is slightly disappointing if they were manufactured things in factories smooth south whistle would probably be the chiefest they haven't done a very good job prickly south south whistle is pretty good Perennial south thistle, even better. They made it bigger and they put hairs on the stems. A lot more going on there. Curled dock looks a bit like the broadleaf dock that you might, everybody must be familiar with, but the leaves are narrower and they are more in and out, and wavy um, around there. It's like kind of crisped around their edges. So it's pretty easy to tell. It likes disturbed ground, just like the ordinary um, broadleaf dock does, but uh, uh, occurs quite naturally in um, these coastal shingle habitats and in dunes as well. Um, next page has some um, <clears throat> distinctive shingle um, strand line species. Sea sandwort, Honkenya peploides, you'll never mistake that for anything. I mentioned it earlier on in relation to the Glauks maritima, the sea milkwort that you get in the upper parts of salt marshes. Um, and you can see, you know, they're both low growing plants. They've got something in common, oval kind of leaves in opposite pairs. But uh, the sea sandwich, it's like really tough textured. Like it looks like it's made, it looks like it almost like it's not natural if you just see the leaves of it. Um, and the leaves go, the opposite pairs are um, twisted around at right angles to each other as you, as you go up the stem. So it has a sort of um, four ranked appearance and they're very thick textured so unmistakable. The sea rocket is a funny branched plant with fleshy textured leaves that are divided up um, really cut very deeply into kind of narrow segments, lobes I suppose technically rather than leafless but almost like down to leaflet um, division and these pale lilac coloured flowers that likes these same sort of places and the sea saltworths you'll never mistake that for anything it's um, it's short, but it, it's quite branched with these very prickly leaves. Um, otherwise, leaves quite ordinary, kind of oval, triangular shape. Um, and those pale flowers, not very, very noticeable, but the prickliness of those leaves uh, makes them unmistakable. And it will grow in um, that and the Hong Kenya will grow in quite deep sand with just these top parts of these plants sticking out um, sometimes. But, but, other, other times you can find them growing in shingle, you can see more of the plant. Okay, uh, moving on to the next page, we've got some um, ragwort, which is um, a familiar plant with leaves that have a crinkly look to them, very deeply divided, and those big yellow flowers. Um, classed as a negative indicator in a lot of habitats in the MPMS and in other systems like the JNCC Common Standards Monitoring. Um, for obvious reasons, because uh, well, it's toxic to animals and, um, and it's very commonly associated with kind of disturbance to uh, kinds of disturbance. It's not always wanted in some kinds of grasslands. Uh, but in the shingle habitat here, it's actually um, the, uh, yes, as Sarah says, negative indicator in sand dunes, yeah. um, but it's actually classed as a positive indicator in the coastal shingle. It's more natural habitat. And um, the bittersweet positive indicator here as well, a scrambling plant with triangular, more or less oval triangular leaves and those lovely drooping purple and yellow flowers that go into red berries later. Herb Roberts can grow here, it's, but so much a woodland plant, um, very, you know, one might think of it as a woodland plant and gardens you get a lot. Um, but yeah, it can go in a lot of open places and can do well where there's been a bit of disturbance or something that's keeping other, other plant growth at bay and giving it a bit of a competitive edge. And it can take quite a lot of light, so it's not surprising that we can find that doing quite well in some of these shingle places. Um, the next page, these are um, not so great looking plants and um, Actually, I should have written, I have written sand dunes on the second um, line up at the top that should be shingle. I don't know how that happened. Well, none of us are perfect, are we? And also down at the bottom, I have actually 
uh, amended that in the version that um, the, the, there'll be a narrated version um, recording as well, which I have yet to do. But yeah, that's why to say that these these are um, NPMS positive indicators in the shingle habitat. Common cats here has rather dandelion-like flowers, but they're on branched stems, um, whereas dandelion's just single. And uh, the leaves are hairy, slightly rough textured, slightly, quite, quite tough textured leaves. With those um, sort of lobe, like big teeth, small lobe edges, and they're all held very flat against the ground. Uh, and the ribwort plantain is an easy thing to tell. Plant all plantains have got the veins all running parallel. Uh, as, as is the case in um, things like lilies and orchids and bluebells uh, and not most other herbs but they're hairy so you wouldn't mistake them for those kind of lily type plants and of all the plantains this is about probably about the commonest one and its leaves are narrow whereas they're much broader in the, um, the greater plantain plantago major common plants of neutral soils neutral grassy places Yorkshire fog with those rather um, thick set flower heads, even when they're opened out, they look quite chunky. And <clears throat> the whole plant's got a very soft velvety appearance, um, velvety sort of texture, common in neutral soils in all sorts of places, in, from shady woods to all sorts of open habitats. Common mouse here as well, that's a, a, a more slender plant very commonly you find it just growing very, very short, but it can get up to about 30 or so centimetres. Leaves, small leaves in opposite pairs, hairy. Um, what else is there to say about it? The stem can be slightly purpley tinged. Um, the flowers are like miniature stitchwork flowers with sort of notch cut in the tips of each of the five petals. Very, very common in all kinds of more or less neutral grasslands. Um, and that happens to be um, among these NPMS positive indicators in the shingle habitat. Okay, next page with some more herbs of shingle. These are more distinctive looking plants. I didn't have, haven't got photos of them, so I've drawn them. Um, sea kale with those crinkly edged leaves and tough texture, bluey gray color, and then clusters of uh, whitish flowers. They're edible. I actually, I actually came across some on the coast of Fife not very long ago. It was too late to get the photograph and put it all into this system, but um, I, I did have a go see what it tastes like. Pretty good, all right, actually. Um, unmistakable. And oh yes, I, I did notice it was the photo on the beginning that Sarah's just said there. Uh, yeah, I thought that's, that's sea kale. <laughs> that makes up for me not having a photo of it. Um, the bristly ox tongue has quite very distinctively bristly, rough textured um, leaves, the upper surface of those leaves. Um, it's quite a good fun drawing that. I think I put the white in with bits of tipex, is where I did that, um, to try and get that bristly, rough look about it. And it has a tall, flowering head branched with these, these yellow um, flowers, composites, you know, dandelion-ish looking flowers, but obviously you never mistake that thing for dandelion. Um, and the yellow horned poppy has very deeply cut leaves, a bit like the sea kale in a way, but um, not so broad. And um, spreading rosettes of them at the base and then more of them up these branched stems which bear the big yellow poppy-like flowers and they then have these long horn-like fruits. Unmistakable thing on, and shingle is very much the habitat of that plant. Uh, okay, next one, next uh, page and some photographs, back to photographs here. Kidney vetch, um, an PMS positive indicator. Uh, leaflets in opposite pairs and the end one can often be longer, bigger than the rest. And uh, a slightly clover-like head of yellow flowers. Um, not quite the same texture, they're quite a furry looking texture to it. You're not going to really mistake that for clover. The leaves are very different anyway. And the plant can be varying from just low grown few stems to something something slightly bushy. Stalks bill in the middle has leaves, again, pinnates, left and right you know, pairs of um, leaflets. So they're quite toothed. A similar um, texture in a way to those of the herb robert, but it's pinnate and not palmate. The herb robert's more divided in a more palmate way. 
Um, and the flower is a bit Herb Robertish in its size and its pink colour, but more uniform colour um, without stripes. And it's a low grown thing of especially sandy soils um, along the coast and also stony shingly ground somewhere anywhere that's a bit bearish here and there and the sea campion likes the same sort of places and has more fleshy texture grayish green color but little flowers a bit like white campion and when they go into fruit they form these swollen um, uh, fruits there that's kind of inflated calyx below where the petals were it's quite distinctive right next page um so that was that was all the species was sort of the selection of species you'll find everywhere you'll find more than i can illustrate um that was, that was the last of the species for the shingle and now into the maher um and maher is a habitat that's defined by being place uh, uh, a place where sort of um sand has been blown in land sand that's got shell fragments in it um and uh, Loading land in parts of the country where it's got a very cool and, uh, and wet oceanic climate. So it's really northwest of Scotland and the west of Ireland. Um, and the vegetation that we have in, in the Macher habitat varies quite a lot. So it's not as if there's any particular kind of Macher vegetation, there's a particular plant community that you can tell that's Macher because it's got this mix of species. It doesn't kind of work like that. Um, it's, it's it's defined on the actual uh, by the actual uh, soils and the, the physical environment. Um, the most common kind of um, plant community in the Macher though is a, a kind of neutral grassland, uh, neutral herb rich grassland, which in itself can look really much like um, grassland that we can find sort of nice grassland MG five it would be in the National Vegetation Classification that we might find in land. And we'll always be pleased to see it in land. Um, but on the coast, on these, these northwestern coasts in the Macher habitat, it can be really extensive. So some pictures of it there. And on the next page is another one. And I got a few pictures of Macher and I thought I'm going to put these in because they look nice. Um, abundance of knapweed, um, just as uh, we find in some of our inland unimproved, agriculturally unimproved neutral grasslands. Um, the next picture has got um, another example of Macher, kind of grassland, but it's a bit damper. We've still got a little knapweed there, but there's, um, there's lots of silverweed. So that just shows just that um, one species being abundant there shows that it's a bit damper, gets flooded a little bit occasionally. Um, and the next picture after this, going damper still, is just a series going casually damper or better, meadow sweet coming in now, and there's some ragged robin, um, and a bit of various other things that we can't see, some sedges probably as well. So this is getting into more the wetter side of Macher, um, and the next picture, even more. It's uh, a mix of, there's rushes and sedges in there, and um, various herbs, um, a lot of angelica, those tall things, tall um, umbella for plants. That's really a kind of that's wetland vegetation. In fact, further away from us, you can see it's grading into a reed bed. Um, so it just shows the range of plant communities that we can get in the Maca habitat. Um, very varied according to, um, to how wet or dry it is. And on the next picture, we can see that some of it is um, it's quite heavily managed. A lot of it is grazed by animals, but um, by livestock. Um, and some of it's been planted, maybe in rotations you can get from um, the crops then to be left for a while and more of a grassland vegetation redevelops over some years. So um, it's, it's uh, subject to various kinds of land use. The next picture has an example again of the um, some uh, not quite so species rich, but uh, drier, grassy macher that's probably been um, had a crop on it in the not too distant past, this, the, that paler part of it. And the NPMS says uh, don't do recording in um, places where, where there are crops for obvious reasons. Um, and also to avoid the more of the wetland um, side of Macher. So it's really focusing more on the kind of neutral grassland, especially the herb rich 
um, drier grassland. So the next picture has another example of um, uh, a wetland. This is a meadow sweet dominated um, plant community, which we can find with the same species in land. We call it M27 in the National Vegetation Classification. Um, and here it is in a Maha setting. And so we wouldn't be using that, put doing the MPMS work in that meadow suite because it's all wetland. Uh, but the ground just a bit beyond there, we're going out into some drier grassland that looks quite reasonably herb rich, and that would be very much a kind of place to do it. Um, okay, on the next page, we've got some of the plant species of the, um, the Mache. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of the NPMS positive indicators in the Mache we've already had before in previous pages. So <clears throat> I'd, um, I thought I would put them there with their names. But I thought, no, I'll put a page first without the names so that uh, to give anybody a chance to go look. I'm not going to look at them and name them, but I'm not going to wait because <laughs> because the this coastal habitat being so big, it's as much as we can do to try and get through all these five fine scale habitats in this session time. So the next page, I've put the names on. Um, and uh, <clears throat> obviously you would have all looked at them and, and got them right. The um, next um, page after this has some uh, different species. These are positive indicators in the Maher the drier mache, um, and there's the yarrow, which is very common in land. Actually, all these three species are very common in land. It's not surprising because the mache habitat, that drier, the dry neutral grassland, uh, is a habitat that we get in land in that sense, but not, not specifically the shell sand, that's the coastal mache thing. So yarrow, <clears throat> those very finely divided leaves, quite um, narrow, but in, in that narrow Width, we've got a lot of a lot going on there. These little leaflets cut right deep into lobes, quite unmistakable. And the flowering heads on the ends of those rather stiff stems, and the flowers can be um, white or pale pink. Um, basically, a neutral grassland plant. Daisy, very common. Everybody knows what daisies look like. And if they don't, then there's a picture of them. That's what they look like. <laughs> They're very short little plants. But the oxide daisy is like a giant kind of like a giant version, much, much taller, but the leaves are really different because they've got um, big teeth or even small lobes around their edges, uh, getting towards the shape of an oak leaf slightly. Um, and it's a plant mainly of uh, un agriculturally unimproved uh, neutral grassland. So no surprise to find that in some Maha. Uh, next page, some more of them. These are all more of a purpley colored, pinky purpley colored, um, positive indicators. The autumn gentian, um, which can have five petals, four or five petals, compared with the um, field gentian, which has four, no slight differences as I've written there in the, the shapes, relative shapes of the lobes um, beneath the petals, the, the calyx lobes. Um, leaves in opposite pairs, nice little plants. <clears throat> Flowers relatively big compared with the, or, um, the size of the plant. Its petals are quite small, but the, the whole the whole flower is like a long tube. Self heal is really common in neutral grasslands um, generally, and has leaves in opposite pairs, and they're wider below the middle, so they get wide very quickly, and then they gradually get um, narrowing, taper to a rather blunt point. They're hairy, and those little like a sort of short orchid-like spike of purple flowers. And the red bartia has a spike of more reddish, dull reddish coloured flowers and its leaves are in opposite pairs again, but they're narrower than the leaves of the cell field and they've got obscure teeth on their edges and semi-parasitic on, on other plants. <clears throat> um, and it does well in places where it's been a bit disturbed, actually. It doesn't do so well in a really thick sward. Wild thyme, finally, that likes um, soils that are a bit more basic or calcareous and uh, places where there's not too much other growth, um, tall, thick plant growth to outcompete it. Um, it's a dwarf shrub, so it's got, it's, its stems are very thin, but they're actually woody and the leaves are small in opposite pairs and they're evergreen and they've got some tiny little hairs on them. Um, 
unmistakable plants, especially in flower like that. And good in, in among grasslands, <coughs> it's actually a good indicator uh, for uh, calcareous grasslands compared with neutral or acid grasslands. And it's, it occurs here and there in some of the drier the shorter macher. The next page has got a few more um, positive indicators. Fairy flax has very thin, wiry stems which uh, the tiny little, very little, small little oval oblong leaves in opposite pairs and these very delicate five petaled white flowers. And um, it likes especially fairly calcareous soils. Um, the vegetation to be quite short as well. It doesn't like tall, thick vegetation. Devil's a bit scabious on the other hand is a big thing um, that uh, <clears throat> can grow in quite tall vegetation and it can get it varying from rather dry to really quite wet. Um, quite wide ranging in terms of the acidity of the soils too. But you can always tell it, certainly when it's in flower, um, the tall branch stems with, uh, with a number of these pale blue sort of um, globular looking heads um, combined with the leaves being in opposite pairs and um, they're a leaf shape that's I suppose it's not not the most memorable leaf shape kind of like a willow leaf a little bit but with a long stalk gradually tapering down into that stalk. Uh, uh, knapweed has a leaf that can be a similar shape but the underside see on the leaf on the left the underside has a network, a very fine um, network of, of lines and veins and, um, and subveins and going all going on there that hardly stick out very much from the surface of the undersurface of the leaf. Whereas in knapweed, it's more coarse um, and the underside of the leaf isn't so flat. So if you just got the leaves, you can separate the two that way. Also, knapweed leaves aren't in opposite pairs. Both devil's bit scabious and knapweed can have leaves with some lobes as well along them. Um, but most commonly without. Uh, finally, the yellow rattle there has leaves in opposite pairs, but they're very distinctive, they're narrow, um, with teeth all the way along their edge, and the central vein tends to be sunk into a, <coughs> a line, so there's quite some texture to the upper leaf surface. When it's in flower, you'll never mistake it with those yellow flowers and the calyx being quite swollen looking, and um, then it goes goes a brown colour and they can persist quite well into the autumn in a, in a very dark form as I've shown on the picture on the on the right. Better move on to the next page and I'll try and get through them. <coughs> Sheep sorrel, it's a bit like common sorrel, they've both got uh, leaves that are kind of oval to oblong with uh, a couple of lobes on each side of the base. In the common sorrel those lobes point straight backwards but in the sheep sorrel they bend outwards sideways and the leaf has a bit of a more greyish tinge. It really likes um, an acid, more thin dry acid soils that species does. Um, but it's classed here as a positive indicator for Mache. Uh, field horsetail, uh, there are various horsetails but this one it's it has quite a lot of grooves, longitudinal grooves running along the stem. They all, the variation in the numbers of grooves between the different species and the, the whorls of branches there, they've got four angles to them. And it's very, uh, quite a range of habitats, dry grassland, even disturbed ground through into quite, quite damp places. Um, but that's typical appearance of the field horse tail. In the maché, damper machers, you'll get marsh horse tail, which doesn't look quite so thick set as that. Um, and, um, and, and doesn't form such vigorous stands as well. The field horse tail can, is, it can get into all sorts of places and is often reckoned, often thought of as a bit of a weed. Uh, knapweed, quite rightly included among these positive indicators. Uh, those long oval leaves there you can see quite a stiff stem it's rather hairy and then a rather thistle like pinky purple flower okay um next page has got some orchids i thought i better put some orchids in because they're um, very common things in there even though they're not classed as npms indicators here but uh, they're a feature and people like orchids um i will not go into all the details of the different species um at least because you can see all these all the, everything I've written in these documents is available um, in the document 
would be can download online. I think I'm right in saying that, that the, the, the PDF documents would be downloadable. And there is this thing has been recorded, isn't it? So um, and there'll be a narrated, another narrated version. So so basically you can get back to any of the text one way or another. So look at all those orchids in different color colors so that you can you could that you can see in the mache. Um, and in the damper mache, the yellow flag, the iris one. And um, a good Sarah confirming that the downloadable PDF will be available. So it is, yeah. um, and um, where you've got so much of the yellow flag in the Maca, if it's as much as there is in that photo, you'll be looking at a wetland which won't actually be an NPMS habitat because um, vegetation dominated by yellow flag is kind of wetland vegetation. Um, and on the next page, um there's some uh, some more orchids because i was gonna uh, my wife allison turned out she'd got some more orchid pictures so i thought let's put those in uh, frog orchid they're not so common green color and fragrant orchid incredible smell fragrant orchid common tway blade and some common spotted orchids um all photographed in maca in different places they actually they were all in sutherland um, Northwest Sutherland. So that's uh, Mache, which leaves us then with the final habitat on the next page. We can start with the maritime cliff tops and slopes, it's called. All kind of rocky cliffy stuff. And there's some scary looking cliffs that's uh, on, on Orkney. Um, next page, I've uh, copied some of the text that it says about taking extreme care when surveying these areas well we don't want to fall down something like that that was on sky that place i was doing some survey work last autumn um big scary dark basalt cliffs um and the next page these are actually not far it's down the coast from um, where i am now uh, across into the scottish borders from east Lothian into the borders um, obviously you're not going to be doing N NPMS work on that kind of terrain. Um, the next picture is actually not far from that, that, that um, picture I've just shown you, which shows some more kind of the kind of cliff top <coughs> grassland that is more doable, the bits that aren't too steep. Um, the, the, the maritime cliff and grassland, maritime cliff top and slope habitat is mostly, for NPMS purposes, mostly grassland and heath um, on the tops of cliffs or on steepish slopes going down to the sea. So there's some of it there, the grassland um, form of it. And the next picture has got some more um, grassland among the rocks. I'm not sure that's so safe though. Um, the next picture after that has um, some more accessible <coughs> grassland. And the grassland in question can vary from being being tall to short, depending on how grazed it is. So that one on the left is sort of very, very lightly grazed grassland on neutral soils. So it's a plant community that we find uh, in land as well, very commonly. We call it MG1 in the National Vegetation Classification. It's that kind of a plant community that you get along roadside verges. Um, tall grassland with umbellifers in it sometimes too. But here it is on the maritime cliff slope habitat. Um, or it can be shorter and a bit more grazed as in the photograph on the right, which is not far from here. Um, and um, yeah, sort of more or less a neutral grassland um, flora. So the next picture has got some heath. <coughs> so cliff top. Heath. This is on Orkney. Um, this again can um, be accommodated. Um, depending on how far, you know, obviously if it goes really far inland away from the, uh, the cliff edge then you'd be looking at um, NPMS heathland habitat. Um, that's, and there's one can go gradually into the other and exactly where you would put the cut off be a bit subjective really. If it was just what we can see here I think that would be fair enough to call it, um, to keep it in the um, maritime um, cliff one. 
So the next picture has got just looking at other variation that we get in vegetation along the maritime cliffs. <coughs> uh, it can be woodland here and there. That's obviously far too steep to be looking at. And even if it was, it would be um, in the MPMS woodland habitat. Um, the next picture has got some grassland and heath that would be uh, maritime cliff habitat in MPMS terms. And these are in Sutherland and they look quite short and quite ordinary from a bit of a distance but there's all sorts of interesting species in there. The grasslands in the upper photo are quite flushed with black bog rush in them for example. The stuff on the left that's a pretty dangerous place to be. All landslips in there with, with some heathland and grassland and some very interesting mosses and liverworts. Um, tucked away among the rocks, the, if one dares to go in there. Um, next picture has got some more, just, just I just thought I'd put them in because they look dramatic, these cliffs, that's what's caithless and normally has seen from a bit of a distance. Places not to go, um, or if, not, not, not to go just sort of casually looking at plants, pretty dangerous. Um, okay, next one, we can look at some um, some species, thrift and sea planting, these are species we've already had before, so I've just put them in again to remind ourselves what um, what we can get that's um, not, not specifically because they might be MPMS positive indicators, although it happens that some of them are, um, the thrift and the sea plantain and the sea campion at the bottom right. But these are, these are just some of the commonest species anyway in these maritime cliffs, along with red fescue, of course. Let's not forget that red fescue we had at the beginning. Um, that's, that's one of the most seriously common plants on maritime cliffs. Uh, next picture, next page. Uh, I don't know why I call them next picture, because each because their page is really, and each page has got several pictures on them. Anyway, this page has dwarf shrubs, because we can have heathland in the maritime cliff top and slope habitat. Most common dwarf shrubs we'll have here um, are heather and bell heather and um, crowberry. And for some of us are saying they come back from Orkney and it was very diverse. Yeah, it's a great place. And um, grasslands and heaths, the interesting, fascinating heaths in Orkney with all of these three species growing in them. Um, um, coastal heaths, that is. Uh, easy to tell the heather from the bell heather because the ordinary heather's got much smaller flowers and they're paler colour. Um, the leaves are tiny and the crowberry leaves have that white stripe running along the underside. So um, those are the main ones. You know, in, in so much heathland, you can find blaberry or bilberry, whatever word you use, or whim, uh, was it whimberry or whirtleberry, different parts of the country, vaccinium myrtillus very very common plants in so many heaths but actually when you get to the heaths that are on, in the maritime cliff and slope habitat that species becomes surprisingly scarce um, that's why i haven't put a picture of it on here um, next page is um, uh, uh, showing some um, pictures of some more species that are mpms positive indicators here some are more, some are common, some not so. The yellow wort is much more um, localized, more southern plant of more lime rich kind of soils. Extraordinary looking thing with those um, like leaves joined together and um, sort of hairless grayish green glaucousy color and the funny yellow flowers. <clears throat> it looks like something's gone wrong somewhere, but it does exist. I'd never seen it until a couple of years ago, and I saw it in some place down south. Couldn't believe what I was looking at. Um, the greater napweed looks like the ordinary napweed, except that if it's in flower, you'll tell that you'll see those big, long, sticking out branched rays sticking all the way around the outside. Um, but even when it's not in flower, the leaves tend to be more consistently and deeply lobed, and you can see some lobe leaves in that photograph. Um, there's also a bit of a difference in the, um, the bit just below the flower head, so even a flower head that hadn't opened or that had gone over, even some of the, the, the difference, the, the coloration in the scales, you know, dark and light, is a bit different, more, more kind of mixed. 
Um, yeah, you can get some long read versions of the common knapweed, so you have to watch that out. They, they are particularly long in the greater knapweed, and that's when those scales, the, <clears throat> more, the, the patterning of the dark and light, can help to separate them. Um, and, and the leaves, the extra lobing in the leaves, more consistent. Um, Bluebell is, um, oh, the Sarah calls it checkerboard effect. It is actually you can just about see it in that in that photo, of the greater knapweed. Yeah, checkerboard, good one. Yeah. Uh, Bluebell on some of the more shady bits of some or sheltered bits of uh, of cliff, especially in the west, you can find a lot of bluebell. Um, and I suppose in those sorts of places, it's not so likely that it's going to be the hybrid or the Spanish bluebell, which we don't really want to see so much of you know when it gets into woods that hybrid thing is a real bit of a pest interfering with native populations so um yeah i don't think that's quite so likely on the maritime clips uh tormentil very very common plant in all kinds of places woods heaths grasslands especially on acid soils um little flowers with four yellow petals and leaves with three leaflets and you can get two stipules at the bases of the leaflets as well. I found a big, uh, plant that was on sky last year with some um, leaves gone nice kind of reddish colour so I thought I'll take a photograph of it. Um, a bit different from the usual but otherwise they're kind of dark green slightly shiny textured uh, leaf. Um, so that's uh, another NPMS positive indicator here. Um, the next page, a few more, which I haven't got too far to go. I mean, um, Scott's Lovage, it's an um, umbellifer, a bit like a sort of small angelica in a way. The leaves are quite tough textured, a bit ground elderish in its look as well. But the stems are more reddish, tough texture to the leaves. Um, and these, then these clusters of white, white flowers, it grows on sea cliffs and even on sandy ground sometimes, you find it in some dunes, all kinds of places, but especially where there's some rocks around near the coast and um, mainly in the north. <clears throat> Rose root is more generally northern upland species as well, with those very fleshy, thick, greyish green leaves um, all sticking out all around the stem, the thick stem, unmistakable. Rock rose looks like an oversized wild thyme as far as its leaves are concerned, but they've got a groove running along the top of them. The main vein is it runs through a groove and they've got little tiny stipules, little leaf-like stipules at the base of the leaves. In flower, it's got yellow flowers, buttercup-sized flowers compared with the little spikes of pink flowers in the wild thyme. Next page, we've got the um, another clover, it's a little one, Bit like white clover but without pale blotches on the leaves and little pale pink flower heads not as big as white clover ones and they're just tucked in among the leaves um, not that common really um, and, and, oh, and these are all positive indicators these species here by the way any kind of milkwort that you get well it'll be serpiliofolia or vulgaris and um, they will class as uh, positive indicators they've got those funny blue flowers which are not really petals but they look like that, um, and little sort of narrow oval leaves. Uh, soft broom, very distinctive flower head with quite big spikelets um, with horns, hair-like projecting horns on them. Um, the whole plant's quite hairy with rather broad leaves as well. Very distinctive grass of neutral soils, neutral and uh, rather nutrient rich or disturbed places it can do very well there. But yeah, sea cliffs as well. And the flea sedge, this is a very different thing, both in its appearance and its habitat. It likes kind of damp, flushed, slightly base enriched ground. And uh, as, as sedges go, it's quite simple looking. The leaves are thin and wiry. You, you, you probably overlook, anybody would overlook the leaves of that. But then when, when it's in flower, you get these heads with all these, all these, um, little flowers clustered at the tip and then when they turn into fruit the female ones they they bend outwards and then down and they go very dark and uh, when they're absolutely ripe if you touch one of these downward pointing fruits it'll um, it'll break off and it'll jump off like a flea and it's good fun okay next page there's a couple of uh, plants again MPMF positive indicators 
Uh, sheep's bit, it's like a scabious type thing, but it's quite small, pale blue, clusters of flowers at the tip, and little rosettes of, um, of leaves, small leaves down at the bottom. It's mainly on acid ground in the west. Um, standard burnet is on more calcareous soils generally, and especially in the south, with these uh, leaves divided into lots of little leaflets left and right and in pairs. Um, leaflets very well toothed and then these funny heads, branched heads with little greenish or pinkish green dense heads. Uh, a plant really mainly of calcareous grasslands, that one very common in some of the unimproved calcareous grasslands in the, in the south, unimproved in the agricultural sense that is sort of make clear because improved is often bad news ecologically speaking. Next page we've got um, this is another southern species, a uh, positive indicator here, um, wild clary, which has branch stems, quite tough textured and hairy, quite roughly rough texture with these opposite pairs of leaves with teeth that are quite big, almost like small lobes. I don't know where you draw the line between a big tooth and a small lobe. Um, but they're at about that point where you be scratching your head deciding what to call it and long thin heads of purple flowers. I did have a photograph of that but it wasn't very good and the flowers had almost all gone over and they were a bit too far away because it was on the cliff and I couldn't get to it um, so I kind of uh, drew it um, and made it better than it really was. Okay so the um, next page has got some Dyer's greenweed, which I haven't got a photo of because I haven't seen it for years and years and years. It's more southern species that just about gets up into the far south of Scotland. And in, in grassy, heathy places on rather acidish soils. Um, but it's also an NPMS indicator here. It looks like a miniature broom, but the leaves are very simple because broom's got three leaflets, um, trefoil leaves, whereas this one hasn't. And the whole thing is much, much smaller. And the next page has got the rock samphire. Um, <clears throat> there's a funny leaves there, fleshy and divided up into quite narrow segments, but of, they're thick in texture. And then these um, umbels of uh, dense white flowers. I drew that picture very rough, a quick sketch. And then I realized I got a picture that I took in Spain when we went there, if anywhere I've once been to Spain, we went there a couple of years ago and uh, I saw this stuff and it was that same species so I thought I'd put the photograph in as well. Um, coastal plant, more kind of a southern distribution that one has. Uh, okay, the, we're almost, almost at the end. Next picture is um, primrose. I hadn't mentioned this species uh, because it's not, in, not an NPMS indicator uh, but it can be very common actually on some especially north facing um, cliffy slopes because it likes a bit of shade, a bit of humidity, somewhere where, it, where it's not going to get frazzled or it's kept rather on the cool side. And in some of those places, like this place down the coast, a few miles, well, probably about 15 miles from here, maybe in a straight line, it, um, it grows so incredibly abundantly that you can pick out a patch of it from, from a long way off. Um, okay, we're almost at the end, it's the negative indicators. A couple of pages of these species classed as negative indicators because they usually, they can indicate or they can suggest that something ain't right. Goose grass and nettle, um, they're, they're common bad indicator, negative indicators in various habitats because they're associated with um, eutrophication, unnaturally high level of um, nutrients input. Creeping thistle, disturbance, that kind of thing, and nutrients as well. Um, actually, the next when when we see the next page in a minute, that'll list the um, the reasons why they're classed as negative indicators. So we just look, go through and see what they are. Broadleaf dock, or curl dock, um, except that curl dock is a positive indicator in the shingle. Um, ragwort, which is also not 100% a negative indicator here. Creeping buttercup is often associated with nutrient enrichment. Japanese rose is invasive in some places. It looks nice, but invasive. Blackthorn and gorse are down there um, in certain situations where, where they can expand. Bramble can increase where there's not so much grazing. Cordgrass in the lower salt marsh zone. Um, 
and finally hot and top fig which is a non-native species that um, can scramble around on <clears throat> um, uh, dry coastal um, cliffs and places and dunes so the next page has a sort of table with the um, tick ticking them off where they are um, classed as negative indicators so it varies according to which of the NPMS fine scale habitats you're in and the, um, the curled dock and the ragworts are actually classed as positive indicators of the shingle but um, negative in certain other situations um, so that's pretty much it uh, <laughs> um, and the last page so the last page is just a wee quick sketch and just uh, saying that's brings us to the end and thank you for being here and hope it's uh, <clears throat> hope it's been of some uh, interest or use or help whatever I'm sure it has thank you so much Ben it's always it's been very informative so many very specific species to be found in coastal habitats so that's always really interesting um, so if anyone's got any questions that they'd like to ask rather um, obviously always more appreciation Ben for your lovely sketches and drawings it always makes it so much better um, we had a couple of questions earlier on um, which were simply about uh, we had a couple about negative indicators so asking about recording sort of ragwa and Japanese rose and obviously I just mentioned that those are on there as negative um, indicators um, and so uh, yeah I've answered those um, somebody was asking about um, help with plant ID on the MPMS website just so just to clarify that um, obviously all of these webinars are able to re-watch either on the YouTube channel or the narrated versions um, on the website um, but also we do have links the BSBI website has some really good um, tips for plant ID um, and we just didn't feel that we wanted to reinvent the wheel in that sense. I'm slowly working on um, some videos which will cover all of eventually all of the NPMS habitats with the species that we're covering. Um, so yeah, you know, it's it's still a work in progress in that sense. But otherwise, um, get yourself a, a good book and learn how to use a key is definitely a really useful thing. Uh, yes, and the Field Studies Council do courses and really good guides as well. Thank you, Rachel. Um, just other people saying that they really enjoyed it and it was really good. So that's excellent. No more questions for you though, Ben. Uh, you obviously just cover everything so well um, that you, nobody needs to ask any questions. So that's fine. <laughs> um, and our next one, I believe, is is that our next one, our last one on bog and wet heath. Uh, have we got rock outcrops? The but... next one is, I'm just looking at the calendar here. Um the 6th of August, yeah. uh, Friday the 6th, and it's the Rock Habitats, yeah, and then Bog and Wet Heath is a week after that on the 13th. Yeah, so we're coming to the end of our webinars, which is, uh, it seems like it's gone remarkably fast, um, but there you go. Right, well, I'm going to make sure that this goes up on our YouTube channel this afternoon, because I'm off on holiday tomorrow, and so I better do it before I go, um, and then everyone can watch it um, in their own time and watch it back, especially if you've got any coastal habitats in your square, it'd be very useful, I'm sure. So thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you, Ben, again, for doing such a wonderful presentation. Um, and otherwise, we'll say see you later, everyone. Thank you very much. All right, thank thanks. Bye. Bye.